Less than a month from now, Republican candidates for president will take the debate stage for a first side-by-side -side comparison. But which, who will make the cut? And which of the Florida men will show? We start today's This Week in South Florida roundtable there with a look from all perspectives, or as many as we can fit at this table. With us today, Bernadette Norris Weeks, who is a partner with the Austin Haney's Norris Weeks Powell Law Firm. Boy, there was more names since last we spoke. <laughs> uh, also, counsel to South Florida government and founder of the Women of Color Empowerment Institute. Jaden D'Onofrio, chair of the Florida Democratic Party's Youth Council, which is focused on building engagement among young voters. Armando Ibarra is president of Miami Young Republicans and founder of AI advisory firm. All veterans of the roundtable, really great to have you back. Um, Armando, you are our sole conservative voice today, not because we didn't try, but we had some people back out at the last minute, but I know you're up to the task. So let me let me uh, start with you. How important are those debates for the Florida candidates, especially next month? Well, they're incredibly important. I think first, uh, you know, the, the amount of time until the primaries is in politics is an eternity. A lot is going to happen. But also, very importantly, Republican voters they want to go through this process, right? When the last time we had a presidential primary was almost eight years ago. I think this process is important so that voters can see what the, are the issues that the candidates are running on, you know, which candidates have the medal to compete for, for this primary. And so it's very healthy and important that we go through it. And I think they're going to get very, very high ratings because people are ready to see this debate. You know, you, you mentioned eight years ago. Oh, eight years ago. I, I was on that campaign trail, and it was a far different campaign trail with former President Trump then than it is now. Um, Bernadette, the the whole format of a debate, we don't e we know who's made it according to Republican Party rules so far, uh, and both two of the three Florida men have. Do you think that it's important for former President Trump to show up because we don't know whether he will? And um, and you know the dynamics we know from television, the dynamics of what the theater of it is is kind of important, just as much as the context and the. Um, and the information dispensed. So what do you think? Sure, I, I don't think that President Trump benefit, former President Trump benefits from showing up. He has such a commanding lead right now in the polls, um, his own polls, other polls that other people are doing. I mean, DeSantis right now is down more than 30 points, percentage points in the polls. I want to talk there's, about that too. Yeah, there's yeah. no real reason for um, the former president to show up. And we, um, all right, let's switch because you're my, my young voice. <laughs> And you are, you, are you in college yet? I'm, I'm just getting ready to go to college now. So you, you know, permit me to notice that you are in a demographic that is not very engaged collectively. And do you think your, your demographic will be watching these debates? And what are you going to look for? I, I don't believe our demographic will be watching these debates that they much. They watch television um, at all? <laughs> I, we try, we try, we watch. And, but, you know, especially with the Republican Party, we certainly are not going to watch these debates that much. Why? Why, um, why wouldn't you? As, as a demographic, I think we are very um, organized behind uh, democratic politics. Um, and our policies have shown time and time again, as we have voted in 2018, 2020, and 2022, three major elections in a row, we have backed the Democratic Party time and time again. I think Ar Armando might want to take issue with what's coming up there. Well, you know, I, I think young people should turn in, you know, tune into Republican primaries. They should follow the primaries on both sides very closely. Our president is, is a, a very high age. There are a lot of questions about his capacity to fulfill a second term. And I think it's time uh, that, or many people feel that it's time for there to be a, a generational handing of the torch to the next generation so that they can lead um, in our country, in our state, locally. And that's why it's very important for young people to tune in because their future is, is going to be impacted by this process. And if they don't participate, then they're not going to have a place at the table. Well, you know, the, the Republican frontrunner at the moment is about the same age as the president of the United States. It's, it's not very, there's not much daylight between them there. Um, I want to, let me, before we leave this kind of, I want to go into Governor DeSantis is in Iowa right now, very focused on the early primary and caucus states, um, and headed to New Hampshire. Bernadette, the, this governor has had such an amazing run in Florida, and now all of a sudden, his campaign can't move his own numbers. His, he's trying to focus on the early states. He thinks that if momentum there will carry him through, but he's not getting that at the moment. Well, what do you think is happening there? 
a campaign reset, laid off uh, close to what 40 people, a little fewer than 40 people, pulling back on his fun, on his spending. W what is what happened? Well, I think that what happened with um, the governor having uh, such a good run with um, the, the governorship in the last election had a lot to do with just very little funding coming into Florida, people writing Florida off completely. I don't think that, uh, and now that people really know what um, Governor DeSantis says and what he thinks and, and, um, and uh, you know, the, the Trump has um, an advantage in that he is a personality. In, in, in many ways, but he's, um, a, sh he's a showman. He's a showman. There's, he, there's he, no dispute about he, that, right? He, he is a showman, this? and, no. and for everything <laughs> that you can say, you know, horrible about him, and there are a lot of things you can probably say, but you know, it, DeSantis is not. And so now that you have a, 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 an election where people have to put their viewpoints out there, really, um, you know, meet and greet voters, which DeSantis, according to Iowa reports, isn't doing a great job with, with that. Um, you know, he, people will see him and see him for who he is. So he, um, I, I want you all to weigh in on that because retail politics is what they, that the name of what you were just talking about, is so important in those states and yet the governor has a record to run on, whether, you, whether or not you agree with the record is, is not, notwithstanding, but he has a record to run on. He's in the middle of you know, what we call the culture wars and is a commanding lead over those. What is, is that important that he is not a, a glad hander or a social butterfly? Well, go ahead, I, what do you think? I mean, I think it's, it's one of the most critical parts of a, a campaign. You need to be able to relate to the people that you're trying to gather around you to, to have them support your policies. Um, and we've seen that fail outright time and time again for uh, Governor DeSantis and his race for, for the presidency. And it's actually so bad that the polls that continue to come out, um, even the most recent one out in Ohio, show him five points behind Vivek Ramaswamy um, for, for, for president. Well, I think running at a national level uh, for any candidate has a, a learning curve. Uh, I think what we, on the plus side, we've seen that his campaign is adapting quickly. They've done a reboot. They are focusing now or, or, or focusing more towards economic issues, kitchen table issues. I think those are the things that are going to move more voters. Do you think that's because the culture war issues are not resonating where he needs them to resonate? I think those issues are important for the base, but I think for any voter, regardless of whether they're the base, they're independents, or Democrats, they want to hear about kitchen, uh, kitchen table issues. They want to hear about inflation. They want to hear about jobs and economic growth. They want to hear about opportunities for their families. And I think he's pivoting towards that. That's very important. He has the best record in the country as a governor on these issues. Florida today is the fastest growing economy. We're creating many jobs. Here in South Florida, we're seeing some of the fastest wage growth and, and job growth in the whole country. So there's a great story for him to tell. And I think as he pivots to that, as I think it, as we get into the debate and he gets to talk in detail about how he's addressed these issues, uh, there's going to be a, a second look for the governor. Do you yeah. think... Um, I, I was going to push I, back on that. I, I was going to say, while all those things are factual on paper, you have Florida families who are just drowning in unaffordable housing and um, a crisis in insurance that I know lawmakers are trying to fix but have not fixed at the moment. Is, do you think that will come up nationally? I think it will come up nationally. I'm hoping that it does. And for everything that um, um, Armando said, there are tons of other people who are saying just the opposite, particularly here in South Florida when it comes to businesses being able to operate, um, not being able to find workers because of poor immigration policies. And you can just go on and on. You know, we're, uh, I want to take a quick break, but I want to just finish this off when we come back. And we have a lot more to talk about on the roundtable, so stay tuned. We are back on the round table. I want to pick up a little more on the Florida men in the race because we have to talk about, well, let's talk about Lionel Messi because we've invited him and he just hasn't responded to come on our show. But but his uh, his first game here was the subject of a raffle from candidate and mayor Francis Suarez, who who, who got that raffle invitation. We did. I received one. Yeah. You did I not. Did not yeah. it, it looks like it looks like they went to NPAs and Republicans and young people. Yeah. And looking for Francis Suarez is looking, our impression was he needs a certain amount of small, it doesn't matter what the amount is, the number of donors 
to qual uh, qualify at least part for the debate stage that he can't participate in just yet. 40,000. 40,000, whoa. But I think he breached the benchmark of 200 states is what he said. But So you got this raffle. Um, did you Venmo your dollar? Unfortunately, it did not. Um, it did not happen that way. Um, I guess I don't like messy enough or something. Um, but I did not. Uh, the reason why, I mean, as we see with the, the Republican primary, um, as I mentioned before, young people are just out of this process entirely. But the one thing I will say about Francis Suarez is I do appreciate the fact that he is trying to reach the younger demographic with a move like this. Um, but until they actually reform their policy decisions on, on where they stand as a Republican Party, I don't see young people gathering around these types of moves. So, Armando, this, this raffle idea, and then also he did what um, the North Dakota governor did as well. He's offering gift cards of $20, so you can actually buy a gift card. It's a great deal, but it's so politically motivated. You know, does that matter to people? I don't know. But what, as, a, as a conservative, what do you, is, is that okay? Well, I'm, I'm sure that... Did, it, you get, did you send in your dollar? I, I did. I okay. have not contributed any candidates so far this year. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing them debate and learning more about what they're, what, how they're going to govern. I think in, in his case, um, you know, I'm sure his, his attorneys uh, have evaluated that tactic that it's buttoned up. It's not going to be an issue. Otherwise, I don't think they would have you know, would have two candidates do it. But more than that, I think what we see is that whenever there are rules, whether it's for debate or something else, people that are impacted by those rules are going to find ways to address them, to get by through them, to, to overcome those rules. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, in this primary, whether it's him or the governor of North Dakota or Vivek, they're all, they're all fighting to get on that debate stage because they know that the debate stage is going to be important for them to get their message out to the is public. Is that important? Yeah. yeah. And, and meanwhile, so you have now the state Democrats don't have to worry about the debate, um, sinking a million dollars into voter outreach. Where have they been? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Where have they been? And hopefully they're waking up. Um, and it, I think it's really comforting, at least for some Democrats, to know that Nikki Freed, someone who has won uh, statewide, is leading this effort. And, um, and other donors are being attracted uh, to Florida because of it. People who had given up on Florida hopefully are coming back and taking a second look. Um, and just going uh, back a little bit to um, Mayor Suarez, I, you know, of the three Republican candidates who may be on the stage, uh, we're still waiting to see what happens with Suarez, but, you know, he is, and I'm not a Republican, but he is the one who sounds the most sane. <laughs> at this point in time. So, um, so yeah, I hope... Is, well, let's, let's, let's <laughs> drill down on that. Why? Is that because, well, I, former President Trump to Democrats, sane would not be a word that I think a Democrat would use, just as an observation. But, but Francis Suarez is a mayor of a city where he is a figurehead. So when he's on a national stage, he can create himself really however he wants to create himself. Um, we've invited him here. He does a lot of national interviews, no local interviews. Uh, I would love to talk to him about some of the things he's telling national reporters. But that, I mean, that mm -hmm. makes sense, what you just said. Well, I, you know, I represent governmental entities, and I can tell you that mayors uh, deal with a lot of issues. And while they are, in, in some cases, um, figureheads, so to speak. Well, he has um, veto power. Right, I mean, he's right. got power, as and I'm I just was, saying. Yeah, yeah, I was about to sure. say in Miami-Dade County, sure. um, or at least the city of Miami, it's a little bit different, you know. And so he does have enhanced powers that allow him to um, make some more uh, 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 relevant decisions on his own uh, for the for the city um, as one vote. So I, I would say that, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully he will get on and, uh, and we'll have a real uh, good debate, at least looking at the Republicans um, uh, from afar, from my standpoint, <laughs> <laughs> but looking at them um, debate with each other because those are, you know, he will bring some different ideas. It's not, it won't be just going as far to the uh, right as we can possibly go and say as many crazy things as we can possibly say, at least the, I think the Florida voters will have to take a listen at least. Right. On the debate stage, you're talking mm -hmm. to everyone, including yeah. coming up in the general as well. I remember in 2016, there were 17 people on there and, and Donald Trump kind of sucked the oxygen out of the room there. So Florida is a third NPA, no party affiliation, a, a, almost a third. Um, so, you know, despite the big gains in state GOP voter registration, um, but with a third of the state, NPA, how do you, and, and young, yeah. how do you attract that? 
I think we're in a beautiful spot right now for the for the Florida Democratic Party. We just announced a new program of over a million dollars for voter registration. We, which we talked about. Um, we're having a massive um, uh, events all across the state uh, over the next few months. And we are also beginning steps to make sure that we engage locally at all of the different colleges and high schools across our state um, for young people as well. That's And that's what the Republican Party of Florida has been doing. There was a, a well, huge Well, absolutely. Push. I think, you know, our, our perspective, our approach rather, has been to, to look at it from the long term. We don't just show up around elections. We engage with voters year round on issues that are important to them. The electorate in Florida is not as progressive as it is in other parts of the country, and particularly in Miami-Dade, where so many Hispanic voters are not progressive. And so when we talk to them about issues that are important to them, that is different than what the National Democratic Party wants to talk about, and they end up alienating many of the voters. And we've been able, through a long-term approach to millions of voter contacts here in the county as well, we've turned a 15-point Democratic advantage in Miami-Dade County, what is now an eight-point advantage. We went from uh, uh, the county voting uh, D plus 30 in 2016 to voting Republican plus 11 in 2022. And these are major changes uh, because we've talked to them directly. We've given Hispanics and many other voters a place at the table, and they feel alienated by many of the excesses of the progressive left uh, and the dominance they have in the National Party. <laughs> Jan, it's <laughs> rolling. I, I call it a lot of disinformation. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is, and misinformation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I know the, the parties have their talking points that, uh, unfortunately, i got to take another break, so we can't really get into it at the moment. But when we come back, I really do want to talk about Dr. Allen's uh, conversation that we had and your impressions about the new curriculum in Florida. So stay tuned. <laughs> One more round at the round table, and I really want to talk about, I know you all listened to Dr. William Allen, who was on the task force that wrote the Florida new African-American history curriculum. Bernadette, I, I love talking to African-Americans about it because of the personal connection, sure. and I found so many people are just incensed over this. And you heard what this African-American man who lived it had to say. Well, what do you think? Well, I thought your questions were great, and particularly oh, <laughs> particularly the one about why did you need to change the, the former group that was actually working on these issues and would have known the most about it. Well, I think that there was probably an effort to put people on who were going to lean a certain way, perhaps, or have certain opinions and um, ideologies. Um, and so I'm sure those were the things that were taken into account when folks were appointed. Now, it's interesting that several people on that board are saying, hey, I didn't, this is not what I said, I, I don't agree with this, and you know, you have two people who emerged, he's one of them, um, who said that they did, so. And, and those people that I've read what, mm. what you read in news reports aren't named, they are, are sourced, and that always it, kind of raises it, my exactly. radar a little bit. And, and the, the bottom line is, I mean, there's no upside, I've never really agreed with Tim Scott on anything, but there was no upside to slavery, people didn't have a choice as but, to but whether he, they okay, were going to remain so, in slavery so or what not. So he, what he's saying is, that's not what the curriculum mm. says, the curriculum doesn't say upside to slavery, it says skills learned personally. Mm. And, and what Dr. Allen's point, I think, I heard was that everyone's got stories. And let me say and this. And that, that was his. And this is a story that's not being told. Yeah. People from Africa came with skills. Yes, They came as mathematicians, as carpenters, as builders, as, as, as art, artists. As, they came with skills as, as, as a skilled farmers. And so in certain areas that didn't have farming, that, that they thought the land wasn't um, good enough to farm, these people, through their skills that they learned in Africa, made that farm fertile. And so, look, to, it, it, it's insulting on so many levels, and that's one of them. And so I, 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 you know, I have respect for whoever this person is. I never heard of him before, but he sounds like you know a, a learned man. But I'll tell you, we certainly would disagree. And I think most um, black people that you speak with in this country. And most white people, I think, at least some of my friends who have said how incensed they are about these comments. I, I you know, I, I would just take a different viewpoint. Did, did you read the curriculum? I, so I read that exact line where it said personal benefit. Um, and I want to take Bernadette's point further on Tim Scott. The Republican Party has five black legislators in our National Congress. Four of those five legislators have come out against this curriculum they, completely. They didn't, well, let me, let me just... Um, massage that a little. They didn't come out against the curriculum, they came out against the wording against of the line. Against that line, line that yeah. line specifically within the curriculum. Yeah. And so, first off, 
a four of five, which is the entire you know African American demographic of the Republican Party in the Congress, comes out against something like this. I mean, there's obviously a problem, as well as with the fact that that goes along with the you know the liberal side of this, where there's obviously just a massive disconnect on what's happening here. And to take that even further, this uh, line within the curriculum has been already immediately affecting our state, not socially, but also economically, where we saw in Orlando, Alpha Phi Alpha, which is a fraternity that was supposed to host an event in Orlando in 2025, immediately pulled out their event, costing our state $5 million in economic production. We actually did a program with the head of Visit Lauderdale. Um, I think there was like a $20 million worth of loss to Broward County, mainly with, um, and not all because of race issues, but a lot of it they did say, cite those kind of, and the NAACP travel boycott. Armando, it's so political. Why is this an issue of politics and not humanity? Well, well first I want to say, I think it's important to have all the perspectives, Bernadette and, and Jaden's included, in this. I think we live, we're going now through a presidential primary. We're, we're a highly polarized country. Every issue is going to get politicized and, and I think sometimes uh, twisted a little bit by national media, I think the discussion that you had with Dr. Allen was uh, was actually really great in that it, it, it really touched on all perspectives. I think that overall the curriculum is, is robust and comprehensive. This this particular statement, a sentence, although controversial, I think what, what they're trying to get to is that despite the heinous oppression, the heinous violence and abuse that slaves went through after slavery, many of them were able to apply their talent, their ability, their determination to overcome that those heinous circumstances and and add so many achievements and uh, so many contributions to our country and you know last year I was I was part of an effort uh, that succeeded in in passing into law a requirement that schools teach about the victims and the crimes of communism and socialism and part of that part of that curriculum also includes on on teaching on how uh, victims of that were able to overcome that whether it's people like Solzhenitsyn in Russia, or Ricardo Arenas in Cuba, okay, or Armando so let me give you, uh, Literally, I have 30 seconds, but I have mm -hmm. a really important question to that. Would you be okay if curriculum in school taught that Fidel Castro gave free medicine and free health care, free education to his citizens? Would that well, fly well, with you? Well, I, I think they, should, they would also need to show the pictures of the hospitals and deplorable conditions. The, Context. The, the, uh, forced labor of doctors sent abroad against their will Con you're talking context. and all those things, absolutely. Context. And I think you were talking context. Look how we all agree, we need context. <laughs> Bernadette Norris Weeks, Jaden Dion Froyo. Jaden Dion Dino Frio. Frio. I'm just Close call now. you Jaden. <laughs> Armando Ibarra, it is great to have you all. Thank you so much for coming in. I love hearing your different perspectives.